Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. This is Chamber Chats. I am the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, and that's why we have these Chamber Chats. I would like to begin, of course, by recognizing that I live and work on the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen-speaking Coast Salish nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. And these podcasts are made possible with the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, and C-SPAN Victoria Shipyards. There is a part of our community that is obvious, but you can't really necessarily see it on a regular basis. And it's enormous, and it's a huge impact on our lives. And that facility, of course, is CFB Esquimalt. I'm very proud to welcome the base commander, Captain Sam Sater, to the program, who is not only a member of the chamber board, but Sam, you and I served together on the board of the Greater Victoria United Way. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Bruce. So the base itself, I mean, we know it's there. There are no public thoroughfares through it, so it's not sort of a random thing like, hey, let's go drive around the base. But it's a huge force in our economy. Let's talk about that for numbers and dollars and cents. How much of a presence does that base represent in our local economy? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And uh, I would also like to start by uh, acknowledging that I'm speaking uh, from the traditional lands of the Kwangun people, specifically the Songhees and Esquimalt uh, nations, uh, on whose lands we are blessed to be able to work, live, and play here at CFB Esquimalt. Uh, And so to your first question, uh, it's a very relevant one. The base has historically been a powerful economic engine in the region, and very much of the region has grown around uh, the base. Uh, Now, in terms of uh, numbers, uh, the numbers are staggering, and I'll give you the numbers, but I'll also put it in a little bit of a more practical uh, uh, sense. So we do have 6,500 members, uh, 6,500 that we refer to as the defense uh, team, uh, composed of military and civilian members, with a combined payroll of $400 million dollars. We also generate, uh, in terms of direct and indirect uh, contributions to the local economy, upwards of $611 million. So those are big numbers. We also invest a billion dollar currently in infrastructure upgrade. Um, But what does that mean in practical terms? In practical terms, that means that uh, there there are hundreds of uh, local small businesses uh, employing thousands of uh, of uh, local members in the community that are interacting on a daily basis. And in some cases, the base is their larger, largest uh, account. That's a, a really a staggering pillar in the economy, if you will, because as we go through the uncertainty of what the pandemic has brought forward, we know that we have the stability of what's going to be happening on the base. And nothing will change that, I don't think, will it? No, I mean, you're absolutely right about the stability of funding and uh, throughout uh, the COVID response, that was a great example where the base continued to uh, maintain core activities. We kept the base operational and safe. And if anything, we actually served, surged the support to the, uh, to the fleet that was deploying. Uh, you know, the, in terms of the impact of the base, we also look at it not just from a financial point of view, uh, because, you know, we, li- we, look, we like to look at it from a triple bottom line perspective. There is the economic side, but there is also uh, the fact that we are, it's very important for us and particular for me as the base commander, that we are engaged in our community. We are good citizens, we are good neighbors, and we contribute to the social fabric of uh, uh, the community. And you sure do, because you have an annual fundraising campaign. Thousands of volunteer hours are, are provided by the, uh, the families at the base. So it's kind of like you're the mayor of a town, isn't it? Is that a fair comparison? Because I think your Twitter handle is Mayor CFB Esquimalt, isn't it? In that case, I can't escape the similarities. Or <laughs> uh, we are definitely, uh, we do have all the functions of a municipality. Uh, but the distinction is that our members live in all municipalities. And they're very proud to do so. And we operate in, out of a number of municipalities and we, uh, we benefit from the support of uh, mayors across the CRD because we do have 23 different sites across the CRD and uh, beyond. 23 different sites, so let that sink in for a minute. So when we think about the, the personnel, the people there, the, uh, the workers, if you will, um, we think of sailors. We think of people that wear the blue and they wear the white shirts like you, but there's a huge breadth of people doing work every day on the base. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, definitely. Um, Look, I mentioned the number 6,500. What is often less um, known is that uh, out of that number, 2,000 members are civilians. Often these are uh, from the local, uh, they're members that have grown here locally, and uh, they encourage, uh, you know, it becomes uh, something that they they um, recommend to their family members to become part of the base. I love going around the base and meeting people that have worked here for 25, 30, 40 years, 
And that continuity is provided to us by our civilian uh, uh, members of the defense team. Uh, so it is great. And then, you know, sometimes I'm in town and I meet someone and they say to me, oh, my, my father or my mother have worked at the base uh, uh, back when the dockyard had this type of ship that we no longer have, you know. And this speaks to how long the base has been around and how interconnected it is with the local uh, uh, community. You know what else I find interesting is the number of license plates around town that say veteran. And you know for a fact that it's somebody who was probably posted here at one time and said when they were sent someplace else, I'm going to go back and retire there because that's kind of the best place to be. Um, there's been a, a very strong priority, I know, uh, to prioritize diversity and inclusion and indigenous engagement on the base, too. You must be very proud of that because it's been very successful. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a priority for uh, me uh, in my command as base commander, but it is something that the uh, senior leadership uh, in the Navy is uh, seized of. Uh, people are the backbone of any organization, and you know we, we do see it the same way. Uh, we look at diversity and inclusion as uh, uh, strengthening our force, uh, keeping it flexible, and we want to celebrate that. We celebrate it as a competitive uh, advantage uh, that we have. It's celebrated as uh, uh, what keeps us representative of Canadian uh, society, but we're also aware that uh, diversity does not necessarily mean inclusion, all right? And so we pay particular attention, and more so now, to ensure that we don't just have diversity, but we also have inclusion where people, you know, our diverse membership is able to um, flourish and, uh, and reach their full potential within the institution. And so some of the examples of how we achieve this is but we have established a number of advisory groups. And those advisory groups, uh, they have a key role in advising leadership on diversity, on generating awareness, uh, creating uh, education uh, webinars across uh, the membership. And we have uh, generated those uh, advisory groups uh, to represent uh, diversity in terms of uh, a visible minority, uh, women's, persons with disability, indigenous uh, groups. And now recently, the most recent one we're very proud of is the uh, Pride uh, uh, advisory group. And uh, just last week, in fact, I was uh, raising the uh, pride flag across every flag mast in uh, the formation and every ship. And uh, this week, we are uh, celebrating uh, Indigenous Awareness Week. I mean, you're such a shining example of that yourself. You are you're a first generation Canadian, I believe, are you not? And a Francophone on top of that. I, I sure am. I'm a Francophone of Lebanese uh, heritage, grew up in Montreal and living the Canadian dream, uh, base commander of uh, third largest base uh, in the country by uh, population. And, uh, you know, very honored to be able to serve and give back to this great nation. And all of us who know you are very proud to work with you on various platforms. Okay, next, I want to talk about the actual role of the base within the Department of National Defense. We're talking today on the Chamber Chats with C uh, CFB Base Command... Oh, that was good. CFB Esquimalt Base Commander Captain Sam Sater, who I mentioned earlier uh, is a board member of our Chamber of Commerce, and Sam and I also serve on the board of the Greater Victoria United Way. So we think Navy, we think ships... Sam, how many ships are based at CFB Esquimalt and what's their sort of cohort? What's their size and what do they do? Yeah, definitely, Bruce. Uh, great question. Um, you know, it, the, the, the numbers are 19 ships and three submarines. But there, there is a lot more to the numbers because it takes a whole um, ecosystem of units to support uh, that fleet. Uh, now, in terms of the breakdown of the ships themselves, we do have the... Uh, Halifax-class uh, Canadian patrol frigate, uh, known as the backbone of the Royal Canadian Navy. Those are the, the you know, that's an, our major warship that uh, we deploy overseas, uh, very interoperable with our, uh, uh, with our allies and uh, packed with a ton of Canadian technology. So we're very proud of that. Uh, the uh, second class uh, is the uh, uh, Kingston-class uh, maritime coastal defense vessel, more for uh, local surveillance and uh, coastal defense. But uh, recently we uh, have uh, an ongoing mission where we deployed them uh, on Operation Carib, South America doing uh, counter narcotics operations. And we just had uh, two of those ships, uh, HMCS uh, Brandon and Saskatoon return. And for the first time they were captained with uh, two uh, remarkable uh, female captains. And we're very proud of that as well. Uh, the third class is the, um, the um, ORCA class, which are patrol craft training vessels. And a lot of uh, folks here in the community might see them in the smaller harbors and coves and marinas. They contribute to uh, the economy along the uh, coastline and they're employed for uh, training. 
And uh, yeah, finally, we do have, of course, last but not least, uh, locally, the, uh, the uh, submarine class, the Victoria class uh, submarine. And uh, the other exciting part to the fleet is that we are about to be seeing new classes of ships here locally, the Arctic offshore patrol ship, which is being, uh, uh, you know, the first of the class, the Harry the Wolf is conducting sea trials and, uh, and the joint support ship, which is a multifunction utilitarian uh, uh, sort of uh, replenishment uh, ship being built right here in BC. And when you talk about the deployments too, you mentioned Operation Carib and other things, tell me about what other functions those ships have, especially when they leave port here and go around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, deployments are, all, you speak to any sailor and that's a highlight of their career. Uh, the, the adage of uh, join the Navy and see the world is still very true. Uh, but of course, the, the deployments serve a, uh, um, a national purpose. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the Canadian Navy's mission, mission at home is uh, uh, obviously supporting uh, defending North America, but globally it is to secure those, uh, provide that global stability and secure those uh, maritime super highways, you know, where they provide that security for trade and, uh, uh, and, and various other uh, commitments to our allies. And so one of those commit, a couple of those commitments that I'll refer to are Operation Artemis, uh, which currently we have HMCS Calgary, which is deployed on, on uh, this uh, operation. And it's in the Arabian Sea, and it serves to uh, uh, conduct uh, anti-terrorism and uh, and uh, interdiction of illegal trafficking types of operations. And uh, in fact, uh, the Calgary has just recorded a uh, the historic uh, record for the largest uh, bust drug bust nice. with 1,200 kilograms of uh, of illegal drugs just recently. Wow, something to be proud of, that's for sure. Um... So the ships themselves go off for certain periods of time. They work with other navies at the same time, correct? Or other sort of military organizations. Tell me about that structure. Yeah, absolutely. We are, uh, you know, we, we're very proud of uh, our uh, efforts to continue to maintain that multilateral uh, uh, cooperation and collaboration. And uh, we're very interoperable with a number of allied navies. Uh, and we, we employ those uh, deployments or those naval exercises to maintain that uh, that cooperation and that uh, this inter interoperable uh, um, function across the board. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the submarines over the last number of years, one of which is going to be back in the water very soon. Uh, they're pretty cool looking ships, Sam, not going to lie to you. People, they must get a lot of attention from people. Absolutely. Uh, we're, you know, it's a tremendous capability. It allows us to cover a lot, uh, you know, a lot of uh, ground, a lot of our vast maritime domain um, through the submarine force. And um, the Canadian submarine force is poised to have uh, three operational, operating, operational submarines by, uh, uh, you know, the end of uh, 2021. Uh, locally, we have the HMCS Victoria that uh, folks might have seen uh, doing sea trials. Uh, recently in and out of the harbor and around uh, the region. And, uh, you know, I, I just mentioned earlier, uh, we're, we're happy to have the HMCS Corner Brook uh, uh, very soon uh, being uh, docked and floated at uh, Ogden Point and uh, will, be a, will also be operational in the local area. Um, we talked too about the role of, of the Canadian Navy within other uh, Commonwealth navies and others around the world. Uh, something else that people may not realize is that a lot of other Navy personnel from around the world receive training here, right? You've got areas like Work Point, which is over by the uh, the new sewage treatment facility. We all know the Naden Gate and the Main Gate in, but Work Point has another role to play. So tell me about the education role of the base. Definitely. Uh, you know, within the uh, gates of the base, we have a number of integral units that were referred to, and one of them is the Naval Personnel Training Group, which essentially is the uh, campus for all Navy training. And it is a large campus. On any given day, we have upwards of a thousand students being, uh, uh, you know, generated uh, through formation, through training, uh, to serve in the fleet. And uh, you know, the the Workpoint area is definitely a hub of that campus. But it, it is really uh, something that is growing, and the Naden area will also have a lot of that overflow. Uh, you you mentioned uh, some of our allies, and we currently are very happy to be hosting. Uh, a couple of hun couple hundred uh, Kiwis from the New Zealand uh, Navy after we completed the uh, upgrade of our frigate uh, program, 
they really like the product that we had, uh, you know, which is really something that is an impressive Canadian technology. And they sent their two frigates up here, uh, and we are we've been supporting them over the last couple of years. And uh, it's provided the, you know, between in collaboration with the base as a support base and Esquimal Graving Dock and the industry partners, it's provided that, uh, fostered that ecosystem of innovation and support. And if you can't answer this question, I understand. But did the pandemic and the onslaught of COVID have any impact on the security elements of what happens at the base? Did that change anything drastically or change anything forever? You know, we've been impacted by COVID like every other organization, and we've had to get creative about how we deliver uh, the business. But ultimately, we, our mission of supporting the fleet and deploying ships and supporting uh, uh, domestic operations has not changed. And uh, the base, for not for one day, uh, uh, you know, could uh, essentially uh, slow down. In fact, we remained operational. All of our core activities uh, were maintained. And we kept, uh, you know, the priority throughout was to keep our people safe, but also keep the community safe. And one of the things that we ensured uh, we maintained throughout the COVID response was always be aligned with uh, the provincial health orders and uh, maintain all of the PHMs that were prescribed. Uh, but certainly we were able to uh, provide the, you know, all the functions across all the lines of business to, to maintain our mission. And uh, part of that mission was also to provide, to be, able, to be ready to respond to any requests for assistance from the Canadian government or the province in terms of uh, COVID support and re remote communities. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about uh, things like the role in the economy and the community, we can never overlook the fact that you are here to keep us safe. And that's another reason that CFB Esquimalt is a huge part of our life in this community. Next, I want to talk about that thing about being a good neighbor. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is uh, the base commander at CFB Esquimalt, Captain Sam Sater. So being its, its own little town kind of thing, medium-sized town, it does extend out so that when your, your people on the base do things in the community, that has a huge impact. That's, that's probably tens of thousands of hours, I would think, and money raised. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, uh, Bruce, uh, w when people join uh, the, uh, and whether they wear the uniform and they have Canada on their shoulders or they join the public service, uh, it's uh, giving back and helping is, seems to be uh, innate. You know, they, they want to help naturally. And it's something that has been uh, very successful here across CIB Squamalt over the years. Uh, so some of the numbers related to that, uh, you know, since the late 90, 1990s, CIB Squamalt has uh, fundraised over $11 million through our uh, workplace charitable campaign. And that is a campaign that we run yearly. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very closely uh, coordinated with the uh, local United Way of Greater Victoria and as well through health partners, but our sailors and defense team members can designate any charity of their choice, uh, really. Uh, but, you know, the deductions are through payroll to encourage and, uh, and uh, promote uh, fundraising, and they every year step up in a big way. Uh, and this year was no different despite the challenges of having to have gone completely uh, through virtual pledges. Uh, because, you know, in terms of workplace, uh, we were like everyone else. We had a number of our people working remotely and just to keep people safe. The other part that you mentioned in terms of thousands of hours of uh, volunteer, uh, I'm always impressed with, uh, with our members' engagement in the community. And that goes back to being proud of living in the community and wanting to give back. And, uh, and so we've... Uh, We've measured it to be uh, around the 125 hours per year per member, wow. which accounts for tens of thousands of uh, uh, hours. And, you know, to a number of uh, local uh, charities, uh, you know, whether that is uh, volunteer firefighters or with hero work or our place uh, or uh, hockey teams, uh, you know, volunteering with sports teams across a vast number of uh, volunteer opportunities, uh, they just want to volunteer and give back. It's like the equivalent of three working weeks. That's really something. And you know, you mentioned about putting on the uniform. Um, we all have shirts that say, I went to Victoria and all I got was this T-shirt or something like that. But when, when personnel go to work and they put the badge on that says Canada on their shoulder, that's Absolutely. a great source of pride. I, it sure is, uh, Bruce. I mean, I wake up every morning, wear my shirt. I, you know, there's a maple leaf, there is a Canada. And you know that feeling uh, often Olympians refer to of uh, wearing the maple leaf and representing their country? You know, we, I, I, I feel like I get that opportunity every morning. 
Yeah. Sam, it's been amazing to work with you both with the Chamber and with the United Way, and you have new steps coming in your career. Uh, we've had the benefit of your work here for, you've been here five years, four years, five years? Four years. I wish you could give me an extension, uh, Bruce. But... I'll write you a note, but I don't think it would help. But you're, yeah. you're, you're taking next steps in your career. Please tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will be, um, you know, I've been named as the appointed, uh, great honor to do so as the uh, director of digital uh, supply chain. Uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Navy and the Canadian Armed Forces and, you know, writ large has recognized the importance of uh, digital transformation. And so we've established a number of, uh, of uh, positions at the national level to enable that. And, you know, we see digital as a capability. Uh, you know, being digitally ready is something that enabled us to get through COVID. And, uh, and you know, for me personally, as the base commander, it is something that I brought back across every function in the base where we've tried to digitize and modernize our business functions and sort of create that uh, smart, modern uh, base, which, which really in this day and age, if you're not integrating uh, digital transformation into your business plan, uh, you're at great risk of not uh, achieving your uh, mission. Yeah. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to work with you, Sam. Your leadership has been exemplary. We very much appreciate all you've done for the base and for this community. And if we can find a way to get you back here soon, we will do just that. But all the best in your next steps. Thank you very much, Bruce. Captain Sam Sater, base commander at CFB Esquimalt. That's Chamber Chats for today. Thanks again to the folks at Check TV for hosting us here in the studio. We'll see you again next time for Chamber Chats. For more episodes of Chamber Chats, go to checknews.ca slash podcasts.